In this video, you will learn how to create this fun, high-energy arcade game using just the HTML Canvas API with vanilla JavaScript, no frameworks required. This particular game is actually inspired by a semi-famous arcade game released in 1977 by Exody under the titular name Circus. As you can see, my version emulates the same structure. We start off with a person being spawned at random on either of these four platforms. They walk towards the edge of the platform and make the leap of faith. It is now up to us to catch them with this seesaw that we control with our mouse. When we catch one person, the other person, the one already on the seesaw, will be shot up in the air. The game is built on a basic physics engine which transfers one player's gravity into another player's velocity, meaning that a falling player caught will result in a previously stationary player being shot up into the air. This system allows the jumps to get higher if the player is coming down at a faster speed. If they aren't because they have been collided off the walls a lot, or for any other reason, then the other player will reflect that weak gravitational force and won't jump as high in return. I decided to make this game primarily because there are many arcade games toys out there, a lot of them using the same tools as me. There isn't however this particular game being taught on the internet which could be because it is surprisingly complex to create. On the surface it may look like a simple game to create, around the same level of complexity as something like Snake or Tic Tac Toe, but in actuality there is a lot going on under the bonnet which will require a decent amount of code to create. For starters we have to create the physics engine, then we have to animate the sprites moving and to top things off we have to work out the collision detection, which for the edges of the canvas isn't hard. But when it comes to a moving line of balloons which repeats itself and needs to pop the colliding balloons out of existence, things can start to get tricky. That is why you should know what you are getting yourself into before you start this project. If you have never made a substantial sized application in JavaScript before, or if you are just starting out, then it is likely that this project will overwhelm you. That doesn't mean that you won't be able to understand what is going on though. The focus in my tutorials is to give clear explanations rather than just footage of me coding. There will also be a link to the completed applications github page posted in the description. It just means that you should know what you are getting yourself into before making a start with the video. Be warned there is a lot of code coming up. I won't waste your time creating the HTML boilerplate so here we already have it pre-made. Inside of the body all we have is this header and this canvas of 600 by 600 pixels. The dimensions of this are important to consider. If you size your canvas differently to mine, then the offsets I'll be using will look differently on your canvas. This is something for you to consider if you want radically different presentations to me. I will lead you through the creation of the JavaScript files, so I haven't created those yet, but I have pre-made the styling for this project. Here is the styling for this pre-made markup. As you can see, nothing too fancy, I hope. This asterisk selector targets all elements. Box size in border box means include the elements margin and padding in the elements width and height values. Margin 0 is there to remove the default margin from the body. Overflow X is there to prevent a horizontal scroll bar from appearing when the vertical scroll bar is needed. Display Flex and the two properties below will position our content dead center in the middle of the page. The result of this markup and styling is currently being displayed. Going back to the markup, we will contain all of our script tags in the body below this comment. Be warned, there will be a lot of them. It is very important that they go in the right order. We need to access specific data in certain files. For us to use pre-existing data, we need to either be in the same file as the data itself or a file initialized below the requested data. This is where we will load up our sprites and sound effects. This will contain all of our global scope variables and functions, data that needs to be accessed on all levels of the application. This will contain our player and balloon classes, the heart and soul of our application. This file will draw the less interactive parts of the canvas like the ledgers and seesaw. This file will handle things like game over and play respawn etc. This file is where we will handle our game states, things like player score and respawn for example. This file will detect collisions and respond to those collisions in the appropriate manner. This file will be like the master script that links together our application into one neat package. As you can see I've created all these JavaScript files here. We will start off with the assets file which is the first file that's linked to. As previously mentioned this file will just link to the assets that we are creating so that you can follow it along succinctly I'll be using remotely hosted assets instead of hosting them on my local machine. The raw link to all of these assets will be posted in the description box below. They can also be found on this project's github repository page which again is in the description. As an example I'll show you the sprite sheets image which is hosted on the github repository page. If you are wondering where it came from, they originally came in a format of individual for images, one for each sprite. I use this website here, again link will be posted, to compile these images into a single sprite sheet which is a lot easier to manage. The good thing about this website is that it also generates a JSON file along with the image. 
This file tells us the positioning of the individual spikes in the spike sheet. This information is invaluable because instead of having to worry about what dimensions crop out the individual spikes, we can simply access the individual spike dimensions directly from this JSON object because this is the actual JSON file that the website generated for me. Here are the three balloon images. There's no sprite sheet for these, just the individual images. Again, if you're wondering where they came from, they came from the GitHub repository here. I just copied the image link and then pasted them in here so I don't have to show you the URL. You can just copy them for yourself. We will then link to the player sprite sheet. As for how we will break up the sprite sheet into individual actions, one for flying, another for walking, etc. We will store the past JSON data from the sprite sheet's JSON file as JavaScript objects. Each object representing an individual sprite will be listed in an array which will hold a sprite relevant for a specific action. Here is the coordinates information for the three sprites that comprise the player's falling animation in order. Again, if you are wondering where this information came from, it came from the JSON file. The information has simply been passed into a plain JavaScript object using one of the many JSON parsers out there on the internet. Obviously, I'm going to close this up just to save up on space. We will then create the other actions. Note that not all of them are arrays. This stand sprite constant isn't, it is just a singular object on its own because there's no animation involved in the player's stance, they just stand there idly. Again, to save you from copying this information by yourself, which is quite tedious, in fact, I'm just going to close it so I don't have to see all that because it's kind of irrelevant information. Again, you can just go to the GitHub repository and you can find the actual file and then you can just copy it for yourself. It's a lot quicker that way, so you can go to assets and then you've got all the information here. Again, because it's quite tedious copying this information, so you can just do that to save up on time. Finally, we will set up the audio. As you can see, this game has three sound effects. Again, don't worry about the links. They'll all be posted in the description box below. You may think that going to the script file this early is kind of odd or out of order. However, we are going to create the function that will prevent content from being drawn to the canvas until our images have been loaded up. This is necessary because in JavaScript, images are loaded asynchronously, which means there's a chance that content will be drawn to the canvas before our images have loaded up. This is bad because it means that nothing will actually be drawn to the canvas when images should be drawn, which will happen because the canvas tries to draw the images, but they haven't been loaded, so therefore nothing will be drawn. Now this function will actually be at the bottom of the script file because it needs to invoke content that's above it. This variable is here because there are four images in total, the three balloons and the sprite sheet. This precrement operator is here because it will actually decrease this variable by one when the if condition is evaluated. This is in stark contrast to the normal decrement operator, which is the two minuses after the variable. In that instance, when the if condition is evaluated, it will just change the value for the sake of the if condition, but it won't change the actual value of the variable, unlike this precrement operator. Before we do anything else, we will need to create a reference to the canvas so that we can extract its context. This is done in the global.js file because our entire application needs access to this data because without it, then we won't be able to draw anything to the canvas. Going back to the script.js file, we will create the function that will be repeatedly invoked on every canvas frame. Therefore, this is the function that will facilitate the animation for everything moving on the canvas. The request animation frame method is what will repeatedly invoke the desired function on each new canvas frame. The clearect method is what will wipe the canvas clean so that new content can be drawn onto the canvas without carrying over content from previous canvas frames. Finally, we will need to call the load assets function when each of the images are finished loaded asynchronously. We will do this in an entirely new function just to separate this code out from others in the same file. This function is wrapped in parentheses and has a pair of parentheses at the end. This will invoke the function as soon as it is compiled, which is on initial document load essentially. So all this is doing is declaring the variable and saying that we want to call it immediately after declaration. Now we can call the animate function down here so that content will only be animated onto the canvas when all the images have loaded up. Now we have done some code here, but if we still go back onto our application, we can't see anything and nobody's gonna appreciate this if they can't see it. So we'll need to do some more work and we'll need to go into the classes.js file and here we'll create the balloon class. The balloons will have the honor being the first thing drawn to our canvas. Notice that we are in the classes.js file. This is because each balloon will be an object instantiated from the balloon class. Here is the constructor for the balloon class. It has five parameters. We'll be allowed to customize its X and Y offset, which will determine the positioning of the balloon. 
The direction will either be left or right. Its horizontal speed is represented by this DX parameter, and this image parameter is essentially us customising the balloon's colour. We will have the balloons moving either right or left in a line, grouped together by colour. When a balloon travels off the edge of the screen in its configured direction, you want it to appear again at the opposite end of the screen, so that the cycle can never end until the player pops all of the balloons. In the left case, the balloon is being judged by its right edge. That is why the X offset is added to the balloon's width. The case will be met if the right edge of the balloon is less than the edge of the screen, or in other words, to the left of the screen so much that we can no longer see it. As for the right case, we are doing the same, except that the balloon will be repeated on the opposite side when the left edge of the balloon is further to the right than the right edge of the screen. If any of these conditions are met, then the balloon will be set to appear on the canvas that they just overlapped. They will still be travelling in the same direction throughout all of this. This is what makes a constantly repeating cycle. This is the method that will get the balloon not only drawn to the canvas, but also moving in its specific direction. This array will hold all of our balloons. We will then be able to loop through it and animate all of the balloons without repeating the same code hundreds of times over. Our game will have three lines of balloons, each with 16 balloons in each. That makes a total of 48 balloons. Instead of having to manually push 48 balloons in, into this array, it would be a lot better if we used a loop to automate this process. The starting balloon X offset is 5. We want the left edge of the leftmost balloon on each line to be 5 pixels away from the left side of the canvas. On each loop iteration, you want to move the next balloon towards the right a bit so that it can be spaced out from the previous balloon. And as you can see, we've also created the loop as well, 48 iterations long. We want 3 lines of balloons though, each with 16 balloons each. 39 multiplied by 15 is 585, plus 5 makes 560. If you want 3 lines of balloons though, each with 16 balloons each. 39 multiplied by 15 is 585, plus 5 makes 560. Therefore in the 17th iteration, we will reset the ball pass to be 5. This will reset the X offset of the balloons, allowing another line to start up again. This will push the balloons into the array in order. So the blue balloons will go first, then the green balloons, and then finally the yellow balloons. Remember, if the if statements confuse you, that iterations start counting at zero. This means that iteration 15 is actually the 16th iteration, cumulatively speaking. Now, the blue and yellow balloons both have a speed of minus one. This will make them travel to the left at the same speed. As for the green balloon, that will be travelling towards the right at a slightly faster speed in comparison, hence the decimal. We'll now go back to the script.js file. We will then call the load balloons array alongside the animate function. Then inside the animate function, we will loop through the balloon store array, and on each balloon inside the array, we will call these two methods, which should, if we check our application, as you can see, we can now see the balloons infinitely moving across the screen in single file based on their color, and this is what we want, so now we go back, and we will go to the background.js file. Now it is time to add some user application to our game. There is not much to this, all we are doing is drawing the four platforms that the user can spawn onto the canvas. Using the canvas's width property allows us to start our lines on exactly the right edge of the screen. We use this canvas's width property to start our lines on exactly the right edge of the screen. The next thing to do is to draw the seesaw. Everything that we draw drives its position from its origin point variable. This means that all we have to do to move our seesaw to a new position is to change this variable. Then everything else will follow suit. Of course, none of these two functions would be of much use if they aren't being drawn to the canvas on each frame. So I'll just give you a quick demonstration. As you can see, they have been drawn to the canvas. Now that we have drawn the seesaw, we need to be able to move it around with our mouse. This global variable in the associated global.js file will hold the coordinates of the user's mouse on the canvas when they hover over the canvas. Since the user may not be hovering over the canvas on initial document load, we set its initial value to be null. To detect when this happened and to respond to it accordingly, we will create this event listener on the canvas object. This E is short for the event, is the parameter that will give us access to the user's mouse position. We subtract it from the canvas's offset on the appropriate axis, and since we only need the user's horizontal mouse position for this game to work, that axis will be the X axis. Since the parent of the canvas is the document body, the offset left property will give us the difference between the canvas's left edge and the left edge of its parent, the document's body. This means that the value returned will be in relation to the canvas and not the general web page, which is not meant to be part of our game, hence the omission. So now we go back to our background.js file. 
The seesaw will only be moved from its default X position of 150 if the mouse pass has been initialized with a value. And now I'll test this out. So we can move it around. The problem is that we can make the edges of the seesaw outreach the edges of the canvas, which is not what we want. So in the global file, this function will take in the current X offset of the mouse pass variable. For a simple calculation, we can see the left side of the seesaw is too small or the right side is too large respectively. If any of these two conditions are met, then we will give the variable an appropriate value to stop the movement of the seesaw dead in its tracks. And so we will use it on this value here. So now if we test this out, we can't move the seesaw outside of the canvas's edge, which is good. We are in the classes.js file because this is our time to create the player class. This is what the constructor for the two player objects will look like for now at least. Its sprite will be the sprite of the walking animation by default, and we will be able to customize which way it is facing with this flipped property. We need this because there is a 1 in 2 chance of the player which makes the first jump being spawned on one of the left platforms. If this happens then we will need to flip the player so that they can walk and jump in the leftmost direction as well as face that direction. As for the state property, that will configure what either of the two players are currently doing, for example whether they are walking or jumping or standing etc. For now though, we will create a draw method to not worry about any flipping motion. We just want the character to be drawn onto the canvas. Notice that there are 9 arguments in total here. Arguments 2 to 4 are used to crop out an individual sprite for the sprite sheet using the current values held in the sprite property. As for where and how the player that makes the initial jump will be spawned, that will be handled with this function. There are 4 platforms in total, therefore this code is set to generate a number between 1 and 4 here, meaning that we could spawn on either of the 4 platforms. This switch case will handle the four possible scenarios. The object that it generates at random and returns is formatted so that it can be passed into the player classes constructor. As for this flipped property, zero means that yes, it is flipped. One means that no, it isn't flipped. There are two players on game start. One is already standing on the seesaw. The other is walking and about to jump on one other platforms. We will put both of these objects into an array so that we can apply the same logic to both of them at the same time on each frame without repeating any code. So we will draw both of these people, but we will soon remove this draw method. At the moment, it is just here for demonstrative purposes. And I'll show you that they are being displayed. Okay, the other one's currently not. But if we refresh, as you can see, it's up there. It isn't being displayed when it's being on, spawned on one of these white platforms and the reason for that is because it's formatted so that it assumes that the player is flipped. However, we haven't actually written the code for it to be flipped, which is the reason why it's currently off the, on the right of the canvas, so we can't currently see it at the moment, but we will soon fix that. Back in the player class, we will create this method that will be called when the person is in the stand state. We want our standing player to be on the opposite side of the player which is about to jump off the ledge. That side of the seesaw needs to be open for the player to stand on. So whatever side it is, our currently already standing player needs to be the opposite of it. Notice that the player is assigned a default value of either 190 or 80, depending on which side of the seesaw they're currently standing on. We also derive a value from the sort mouse xpos function. Because if you remember, that will give us the coordinate that the seesaw bases its entire presence off of. We want our person to be positioned in relation to that, of course. As for the seesaw, we need it to be changed because whatever side the standing player is on, that side needs to be weighed down more than the side which will be propped up from the lack of any player. Notice that we sandwiched the if else condition in between the begin path method and the stroke method off the context. This will draw our stand regardless of which condition is met. To make it so the stand method can be run when the state of the player is set to stand, we will remove this draw method. In its place will be a switch statement that will run the method currently relevant to the state of the player. All of these methods run the draw method themselves, so there is no need to have that method in the loop. Okay, so we won't be able to see the player standing on the platform, but we should be able to see the player standing on the seesaw. And as you can see, we can move around along with the seesaw. We could also refresh and it's on the correct side, and this is good. Great, now let's get to the player being animated. Remember that by default, player 2 starts off walking and then jumps off the edge of the platform they were randomly spawned on. Because of this, we will need to create two more methods, a walk method and a jump method. So we'll create these two more fields because the walk method needs them. So we use this ternary operator here because the walk speed will either increment the X offset or decrement it based on whether the player is flipped or not. It is this factor that will determine whether the player moves either right or left. You may be wondering what this percentage sign does and how it facilitates our sprite animation. 
It is called the modulo operator. It will give us the remainder of these two numbers divided by each other. At the moment, sprite frame will be zero. The remainder of everything divided by zero is always zero, which is a full number, so therefore the remainder will be zero. So when we do this, it means that we will be accessing the first sprite from our walk cycle array, which is two sprites long. Sprite frame will soon be incremented though, as it is down here. When this happens, sprite frame will be one. 1 divided by 2 is 0.5, which means that 1 it will be the remainder, since none of it goes into 2. A value of 1 will give us the second and final spikes from our walk cycle array. So next time spike frame is incremented to the value of 2, the animation cycle will repeat itself because 2 divided by 2 is 1, which is a whole number, and so therefore there are no remainders. Likewise, 3 divided by 2 has a remainder of 1, and so on and so forth. So the animation will just keep on repeating itself, and we'll need to make it so this walk method can actually be called. And so now we'll see what this looks like. Okay, so things are looking pretty crazy. For starters, the sprite is moving way too fast to even faintly resemble a walk. Secondly, we'd have the issue, if I could show it, of this right-facing sprite walking backwards. For this to look good, we need the sprite to be facing towards the left so that the animation could be flipped horizontally. To fix the first issue, we will create this property. It will be incremented on each animation frame. We will use it to change our sprite, but only when 10 canvas frames have elapsed. This will effectively slow our animation down, making the walk look more natural for a change. And so now we should be able to demonstrate this, and as you can see, it's actually looking at an appropriate speed. We create this if condition because the player will only need to be flipped in the walk state. None of the other sprites require themselves to be flipped for the game to look proper. Notice that we sandwich this if else block in between these context save and restore methods. We do this to prevent our context from repeatedly applying the same transformations to itself. If we don't restore the context after it has been drawn to the canvas for that specific frame, then other content drawn to the canvas will also be flipped. We do this because if we didn't restore the context after it has been drawn to the canvas for that specific frame, then other content drawn to the canvas will also be flipped. So this code allows us to isolate the flipping of the canvas so that it actually affects player 2 and nothing else. The way that this works is that we move the entire canvas to the sprite's origin or its top left corner. We do this here. Below we flip the canvas on its horizontal axis as signified by the first parameter. Now it's minus one which means the same width just flipped over. Because of this we don't need to position the image with its draw image function which is the reason why it's zero zero. Because this canvas will handle all of the positioning for us. These two context statements will allow us to not only flip our player over, but also flip our player over at the player's origin. This is perfect because we do not want our player to be moved to a position that we did not choose ourselves. And I'll just demonstrate this to you. As you can see, he's walking and it's looking good. There is a problem, however. It comes from the fact that our player's current position, when it is flipped, and its actual X and Y offsets are not in alignment like they would be if we didn't flip the player around. This may not seem like a very troublesome issue, however it is best that we get the problem solved now to make things a lot easier for us later on, when we will be relying greatly on these x and y values for collision detection. This walk speed store property will be incremented to reflect the real x offset of the player too, as if it wasn't flipped on one of the left side platforms as it is. So as you can see, we increment its value just like we would if it wasn't flipped as signified by this one value. Now that we have that out of the way, we can move on to what it is necessary for. That is getting the player to jump off of the edge of the ledge that they were spawned on. So we will create these three new fields. So we'll create three new fields here and an extra one here. And we create this so that we can preserve the unadulterated X offset which hasn't been incremented. This condition will mark the point where the player needs to jump for both the left side platforms and the right side platforms. As you can see, if the player was flipped, then we will subtract the X coordinate by the walk speed store field when the player needs to jump off the ledge. Again, this is to restore its offset to its original unflipped value so that we can get proper collision detection working. We need to do this because the player will no longer be flipped as we told our application to only flip the player when the player was in a walk state and nothing else. Therefore, if we don't have this code, then the player will not be in the correct position when they do transition into having unflipped sprites that are not positioned by the canvas, but position themselves instead. Now, we will be starting a new animation when the player makes the jump. We want this animation to start from frame zero. The problem is that the sprite frame field may not have the appropriate value zero to reflect this beginning animation frame. 
This method will be called whenever you want to change the player's state from one action to the other. The purpose of the first parameter will become clearer later on. As for the second parameter, the width, we need it because in the flying animation the player has their hands outstretched. This makes the sprite naturally wider than its walking or stationary counterparts. So if we use the same width for it as we used on the other animations, then it would just look squished up. To prevent this, we will simply increase the width of the sprites when we begin the jumping animation. And we will do that here. As you can see, it's 50 when the width before was 30. Now we'll actually create the jumping method. And of course, we'll actually have to make sure that it is called when the state of the player is jump. So the start jump boolean is set to false as soon as the player switches from the very first sprite on the jumping animation. Furthermore, you want the first sprite in the sequence to only be shown if the player is low enough. This is to make it look like the player is getting ready to land on the seesaw. So we're going to see what this looks like. As you can see, things are not looking as they should. This is due to the absence of any physics engine. On Earth, you cannot jump without the counter force of gravity and friction. This is why the jump looks so unnatural. We don't have these forces on our game yet, but it is now time to solve this. And we will we'll go to the global file. They are global variables because we want them to be reflective of the environment and not a specific item in the environment. Back in the jump method. The gravity will be applied to the player from the start. This means that the player's jump will gradually slow down before they begin to fall back down onto the ground. As for the friction, it means that on each frame the player's velocity on the x-axis will get smaller by 0.8 of itself. This means that it will eventually come to a halt but will never go in reverse of itself. And so now we should have it fixed, we refresh. So, yep, as you can see, obviously he's going through the floor, but it does look like a more realistic jump. The next step is to clearly fix that issue and actually catch the player. We will start by creating these three variables. They will help us determine the X velocity of our player, which will be sent up when the other player lands back on the seesaw. So in the script file at the bottom of the animate function, you will increment frame crowns, but only if mouse pause has been initialized. So on the very first frame, prev mouse x position will hold the current x coordinates of our mouse position. But 14 frames later, you will assign velocity x diff, the difference between the x coordinate 14 frames ago and the current x coordinates of the mouse. We divide this number by 4, but essentially we are working out the distance that the seesaw has moved in the time span. We'll divide this number by 4 to just weaken it a bit, but essentially we are working out the distance that the seesaw has moved in that time span of 14 frames. So now that we set all this up, we can actually focus on catching the player for real this time. This if condition will be activated when we need to evaluate if the player is hitting the seesaw or not. That is, if the player is falling and they are below a certain height, which would make them very close to the seesaw. It is now where we will create our first collision detection function. This if condition evaluates whether the collision was successful or not, based on which side of the seesaw is currently open for the player to land on. These return conditions here evaluate whether the collision was successful or not, based on which side of the seesaw is currently open for the player to land on. This in itself is determined by whether player 2 initially spawned on either the right or left side. You'll first deal with the boolean being false because the collision has been unsuccessful. If this is the case then we will trigger another and final player state, that is the player falling state. So we'll add this in the classes.js file. So this is what the fail function will look like. There are three sprites of total of this animation. The frame rate field will only be incremented if we have not reached the last sprite in the animation. This means that the last sprite in the animation will remain unchanged until the player respawns itself. As always, we want this method to be called when the player is in the matching state. The player will be put into the state if they miss the seesaw, furthermore their height will be set to be fixed on the canvas floor. A game over sound will be played, and this new state method will reset the sprite's width back to 50 to maintain sprite width consistency, and reset the other values that need to be reset when a player changes state. And so now we'll demonstrate this, we'll refresh so we can actually see it. Jumps off, and then as you can see, the sound plays and he's on the floor, so this is looking good. Now we need to do the case where the player actually does land on the seesaw and we'll send the other player shooting up into the air. That will be in this else block. The player that has successfully landed will be set into standing position and the seesaw will be flipped accordingly. We know that this will happen because we have changed the player 1 coordinates value which was the deciding factor in which side the seesaw was tilted towards. Notice that this velocity y store has been created. 
This will store the velocity of the falling player right before it is reset with the new state method. We do this so that the other player can be assigned the same y velocity in reverse. So that instead of falling they do the opposite and leap up into the air at a speed appropriate to the other player's speed when they landed on the seesaw. As for the other player, to begin sending it into the air we must first access it. We can do this by finding out the index of the player which collided with the seesaw and whatever player did make the collision, the player that needs to be sent into the air will be the opposite player in the array. This if statement will make it so no players can still be flipped after the first collision. This is what we need because from here on the velocity logic will become unidirectional, meaning having a flip player will simply be an inconvenience that will cause more problems than it will solve. As for the actual change in velocity that needs to happen to send the player flying back up into the air, these will be handled with functions that will tweak the velocity changes in ways designed to enhance the player's experience in the global.js file. This global variable will keep track of the number of collisions that have occurred between either of the two players and the seesaw in a player's lifespan. It will come of use to the functions that we are about to create. Of course we will need to ensure that it is updated properly. All this function will do is modify the y velocity transfer from the falling player to the jumping player, providing that certain scenarios are met. Those scenarios are, if player 2 spawn on either of the topmost platforms, then we will increase the velocity a bit for the first two collisions, so that the players don't reach the balloon straight away. Although this may sound counterintuitive, increasing to decrease the velocity, the velocity that sends the player upwards will actually be the reverse of its normal value. So in this case, adding will do the opposite when we want to send the player up. Likewise, if the player was spawned on one of the bottommost platforms, then we will increase the velocity a bit, so then it will reach the balloons a lot faster. This function will deal with the new x velocity that's assigned to the player that comes up off the seesaw. It will capture the current value of change x velocity as a parameter. If it is found to be too far in one direction, then we will limit it to a set value of 35. Likewise, if there has been no change in the x offset of the seesaw over 50 frames, then you will add a slight x velocity push to the player based on which side of the seesaw the player is standing on, so things will look more realistic. Values returned from these functions will now become the new x and y velocities for the player, which will be leapt off of the seesaw. Likewise, we will set its start jump boolean to be true, which will of course be changed when the second frame in the jump animation is met. Okay, so we just spotted an error actually, and that's that this. Needs, we need access to the index of the item that we're currently looping through, so which player we're currently looping through, and it's used in this if condition here. Very important that we include that, but we should now be able to see our work and it should be paid off. And obviously we can move it around as well and so if you move it really towards the right, wait hold on. As you could see we could get him move it all kinds of places and you could also get him to fail. And what we need to do now is a collision section with the war, so we'll go to the relevant file. So in this function which detects whether the players hit the edge of the canvas, we check to see the players hit the right side of the canvas, the left side of the canvas and the top collision respectively. We don't check the bottom of the canvas because that's already handled based on whether they've hit the seesaw or not. And inside, not only do we reflect the player's current velocity based on which axis caused the collision by multiplying this associated velocity by minus one, we also set the associated offset of the player to be right on the canvas edge that it collided with. If we didn't do this, then there's a chance that the player was travelling so fast that when the velocity change happens, the player is already inside of the war, meaning that it will get stuck in the war, never having enough room to travel in any other direction. Obviously for this to work, we need to apply it to a loop, and obviously the player needs to be in mid-jump in order for a collision to occur, but we will check to see if this is working properly, and we'll try and get him, so I don't know if you... Yep, as you can see, he is bouncy up, definitely, there's no, that's unequivocal, there's no doubting that. However, in the final application, the player actually spanned when they hit the edges. So we'll go to our player class and implement the feature. We will add these two fields to our player class. The spin num is currently 270 because 3 times by 90 is 270. This relates to the nature of the spinning animation where every time the sprite changes the player is rotated by 90 degrees. But the normal animation starts at a point where the player is rotated by minus 90 degrees from their normal non-rotated position. Hence the value of 270. This is the method that will get the player spinning. It will be called if its should spin field is set to true as it is set to false by default. 
Rotation in canvas works by rotating the entire canvas around the canvas's origin or its top left corner. This means that our player will be moved out of alignment when the canvas is rotated because it is being pivoted around a point far away from where the player's real position actually is. The solution is to move the entire canvas so that its origin lies within the middle of our current position of the player sprite. These two variables will hold that midpoint position. Once rotated, we need to move the canvas back to what it was before, so that everything else drawn below will be positioned as if the canvas has never moved. So as you can see, once you've rotated it, we move the canvas back to what it was before, so that everything else drawn below will be positioned as if the canvas was never moved. As for what we are doing here, what we are doing is telling the canvas to rotate clockwise by whatever value is held in spin num. The extra code is simply converting the degrees value of spin num into radians, which is an alternative measurement to degrees that computers find easier to work with. The first if statement will make it so the sprite's rotation only changes every 10 frames, just like the sprite changes themselves. The second if statement will reset the rotation, so instead of being 360 degrees, spin num will simply go back to being 0 degrees unrotated. We move this if statement into this if statement here because it wouldn't make sense for the player to look like they were bracing themselves to land on the seesaw when they are in the midst of spinning about. Likewise, the player should stop spinning immediately as soon as their state is changed to something else. As for when the player should be made to spin, that should happen when they collide with one of the canvas edges. First though, we create this function. It will be called when our player is set to start spinning. We want it to skip immediately to the next byte along in the jumping sequence as soon as the player begins to spin. This will make the animation look a lot smoother. And so now we should be able to go on our canvas application and see the user spinning when we hit the sides of the canvas edge. Just quickly, as you can see the spinning about, again there's no point. And then obviously when they jump up again, it's all fine. So this is all good. But in the final version, the player is able to collide with the side ledges, but only when they are descending. When this collision is made, the player will slow in their descent. This variable will act as a cooldown period between the time the player collides with the ledge and when they can make another collision with the ledge. We don't want the player to be able to collide with another platform immediately after collision because otherwise they'll be slowed down too much. Everything inside of this if condition will only be met if the player is falling and falling at a speed of at least minus 5. Before we deal with that though, we will create this function that will reset the boolean value after a period of 1 second has passed since the collision. A period of 1 second because 1000 milliseconds, which is what this is measured in, is the same as a second. Now here is the collision section values. There's 4 conditions because there's 4 platforms, and in each one we will do the same thing effectively. Slow down the y velocity, which means you slow down the player's descent. Now I know that this is a lot of code, which is the reason why I've zoomed out so that you can see it all. Again, to save you from having to write out all of this, you can just copy it from the GitHub. What's more important is that you actually understand what's going on. Now, inside of the loop, this is a pretty involved if condition to check for whether a collision has occurred. A necessary one, though, to make sure that all possible errors are avoided. Now, there isn't any point having me demonstrating this feature to you because it is too fiddly to happen by will. I can assure you, though, that things are working as they seem. Now, we'll go back to collision text and file and work on getting the user to pop the balloons. For starters, we will create this function. Its purpose is to generate a set of values that will represent the hitbox for the player at a specific frame. This will then be matched up with all of the balloons to check for a collision. The hitbox makes concessions to the sprite's horizontal axis. This is because we are cropping out the player's arms, so it is only a body collision, not an arm collision, that will pop a balloon. As for the sprite's rotation, say if it is currently in mid-spin, we needn't worry about that because the sprites share the same width and height values at the moment, meaning rotation will not affect its offset. This will be the function that actually checks for a collision between the player currently in the air and any of the balloons. As you can see, it uses the hitbox function that we have just created. You can read the comments to see which statement is detecting which collision, but essentially the function is just checking for a collision. It doesn't have to be a collision on a specific side. The statements in question check to see if a collision is not taking place. The exclamation mark versus the boolean value returned. This means that true will only be returned if the opposites of all of the collisions are met, which would signify a definite collision between the person and a balloon. The reason why it checks for all of them is because normally these pipes would mean or, however because we use this bank operator it actually means and.
Now, these conditions left as they are are not sufficient. That is because there is a chance that we may be able to pass through a full line of 16 balloons without popping a single one of them. This is because there is a gap that is roughly 17 pixels wide between each of the balloons in a line. Taking into account the player hitbox, which is 13 pixels wide in width, because 2 times 6.5 is 13. It is therefore entirely possible for our player to just pass through this gap without popping any of the balloons. This long comment above explains what we are doing here. The values that we add to the hitbox are there to make it a one pixels wide strip that will make it impossible for us to slip through any gaps with the other modifications that we have made. Those other modifications are what we have done to the individual balloons. We have expanded its horizontal hitbox by 16.5 on each side. 16.5 because that is half of 39, which was the space between the balloons that we used when instantiating that array using the loop if you remember. Now it will be impossible for us to slip through a gap. This function will handle just that. All this function has as a parameter is the index of the colliding balloon. This is necessary data because it will allow us to remove the item from the array at that specific index, effectively purging the balloon from the game entirely. So when this function is called, a balloon popping sound will be played and the balloon will be removed from the array that it was formerly stored in. The splice method will handle the latter. The one represents the fact that we want to remove one item starting at the index, which is the first argument. The splice method is in a set timeout function with a timeout of zero because if it wasn't, then our canvas would try to render the balloon at the same time as we deleted it from the array. This will cause a visual distortion. The set timeout function will prevent this. It means that by the time the next frame rolls around, the balloon will already be removed from the array. Now that we've created this function, we can create the function that will handle the main bulk of the logic that will be called on a collision between balloon and player. This index variable will be used to call the remove balloon function of its desired parameter. I am mindful that this is a lot of code and you can read the comments in case you don't understand anything. It is just a lot better if my main focus is on explaining the code rather than you just watching me code laboriously. As for what it means, the first two conditions check to see if the person has collided with the balloon on either its top or bottom side within the constraints of that one pixels gap that we had as the final condition of the has player hit balloon function. The last two conditions just check to see the collision between player and balloon was on the left side or right side respectively because remember the has player hit balloon function was unidirectional. In this function we are getting more specific and identifying which side the collision occurred on so that we can respond to it in the appropriate way. We will find out which player is currently in the air, since the game is designed so that there can only be one of those at a time. Providing that a value has been returned, we will use the currently in the air player on these functions. Since all of this is done inside of a loop, the code is all that is needed to carry out checks between the airborne player and each and every balloon that is still rendered to the canvas. We will find out which player is currently in the air. Since the game is designed so that there can only be one of those at a time, we can just do it by simply checking to see which person is in the state of jump. Providing that a value has been returned and a player is in the state of jump, we will use the currently in the air player on these functions. Since all of this is done inside of a loop, the code is all that is needed to carry out checks between the airborne player and each and every balloon that is still rendered to the canvas. And so now we're going to check out this code to see if things are working properly. So he's jumping off, okay, we're going to have to reach the balls, okay, yep, we reached the balls now. And yep, there was a side collision, a couple of side collisions there. And yeah, things are looking good actually. As you can see, yep, yeah, definitely, the, yep, yeah, the collision section starts it. Oh, can ca I catch the person? Okay, a bit slow now, but hopefully we're gonna work our way back up. But anyway, I don't need to show you the rest, you can play it yourself. Great, so you have made it to the final part of this tutorial. From this point onwards, everything will be smooth sailing because all that is left to do is handle the game logic. So things like the score, player lives, new level, etc. It's probably been a long time since you've seen this, but we are back inside the HTML file. We want the user to be able to see the number of points and the number of lives they have remaining. So here is the styling for the markup that we just created. We will also incorporate a main menu of sorts. The user will have to click on the start button in order to start the game. We will also incorporate a main menu of sorts. The user will have to click on the start button in order to start the game. And of course, here is the associated styling. There's actually four selectors that I've just created. They're here. Again, check on the GitHub repository if you're confused. But essentially, we have what we have here. But then, obviously, nothing's going to work because look, it just 
completely breaks because we can't even move and this isn't going anywhere. So to interact with HTML elements, we'll first need to create references to them. These global variables will also be used in conjunction with HTML elements to manage the game state. As for this one, it will act as a kind of master boolean because our game will not start without its value being set to true. So instead of these two functions being called when all of our images have been loaded, all that will happen is this previously false boolean will now be set to true. These two removed functions will not only be called if this boolean is set to true and the user clicks on the main menu button to signify that they want to start the game, and all of the code related to the user clicking on the start button will be handled in this event handler. If they have clicked and all of the images are loaded up, then the main menu will disappear and we will call these two functions. We will also initialize the mouse position to what it was when we clicked on the button. This is to make it so the game cannot run without mouse pos being initialized with a value. So now if we go back to application, as you can see, there's nothing on the canvas. We click play and the game starts and there's no errors there. Everything's working as it should. We'll go to the game state file. This function will allow us to update the user's score of a value chosen by us. We'll use it inside the collision section file. So the user will score points when they pop a balloon and the amount of points that they score is determined by the color balloon that they popped. They also score 10 points for a successful seesaw catch. And we now want to make the player able to be respawned because as you can see, we've got three lives, but if they do die, then nothing happens. I won't show it because there's no point. So I'll go to game state. As you can see, we set the game main menu to flex, which means that we reshow the same main menu that was shown to the user at the start of the game. The difference now is that we change its content to show a more appropriate message. So restart instead of play. This is the function that will call that end game function if there are no lives remaining. If that isn't the case and there are still lives remaining, which is down here, then we will reinitialize the key global variables that are necessary for the player to respawn. We will also update the lives text on the game menu to its new value. The player response function will be caught after a two seconds delay, starting from when the player first hits the ground after missing the seesaw. This will give us time for the music to play properly. We will create a new function for the separate occasion of the user clicking on the main menu button, not to start the game, but to restart it instead. Here is that restart game function. It is similar to the respawn function. All we are doing is reinitializing more values and reloading the balloons again. Finally, we will create a function that will reload all of the balloons when the user has popped them all. It will work similar to the restart function, except that the player's score will be retained because they have not failed yet. It will actually pause the game for a short period of time. To do this, we will need to assign that global variable we created a while back to the request animation frame method. So there's two set of timeout functions here. The first one will wait 10 milliseconds until pausing the game. The second one will wait for two full seconds until unpausing the game. The function will be called every time we remove a balloon. We never know when we have removed them or if we have still got balloons left to clear. So here we have a completed application. I know that this was a really long and tedious video, but I hope that you learned how to make a new type of game that hasn't already been covered on the internet numerous times. If you have any questions, then please don't hesitate to ask me them in the comments box below. I would love to hear back from you and will answer anything that you have as soon as possible. Likewise, you would be doing me a huge favour if you considered liking and subscribing. I would definitely recommend this if you did benefit from this tutorial. But more importantly, look after yourself and peace out.